It's time for Day on the Homestead. It's uh, time to do a Day on the Homestead video. These uh, seem pretty popular, these videos. I always expect them to be not that popular, but they are usually. So we'll see how this goes. There's just a bunch of work to do. It's a gray, sleety, cool day. I don't know, we'll see what we get up to today. Okay, I'm just uh, starting a fire in the wood stove here. No, I'll be outside most of the day, but. I just want a warm place to come. It's pretty nasty out. Well, I'm consistent. <laughs> I'm just not hitting the right spot. Here's something I do a lot that's really cool is I'll, I'll chop across a piece of kindling like this. This is to make stuff to start the fire and then come in like that and you end up with all these nice little sticks. And sometimes I'll leave them attached, sometimes I pull them apart, just depends on what I'm doing. But I use a lot of pitch wood starting fires. And I kind of stopped using it in here on purpose, just to, just to stay in practice. Like I don't ever use paper to start fires. I'm like almost never, less than once a year. And there's actually kind of a rule here on the homestead that we don't use paper to start fires. Partly because uh, I always want my ashes to be real clean. No like newsprint ink or anything. But also it just keeps us in practice. Any, what, anybody that's here, you know, anyone that visits, they have to learn how to make a fire without paper, which is surprisingly hard for a lot of people. So I don't know if you can see in here, but I just have a bunch of sticks kind of laid and crossed, like three or more. Uh, this is a method I use a lot for starting fires. And then I'll take, you know, in this case, I can't get in there with the lighter, so I'm just gonna light this and stick it under here. So I do this a lot, I hope you can see in there. Well, I'll just, you know, cross a few sticks to get it started and then immediately start laying the smallest stuff I have up in there. Somebody showed me this a long time ago. The guy's name might have been John uh, in North Carolina at Pepperland Farm Camp when I was a counselor there. A couple people up there probably know Stephen Taylor, AKA Snow Bear. He used to run that camp. I also met Eustace Conway there when he was very young and I was even younger, I was 19. Anyway, this guy showed me this this way of starting fires by laying three sticks all crossing at one point lighting that and then adding stuff and i pretty much that's my mainstay ever since um it has some advantages like for one thing it's real adaptable so as things change you can use the materials that you have you know to get the thing going there's way less setup time so you don't spend all this time like setting up a bunch of stuff to make sure it starts, you know, with uh, a single match lit at one point and then you just walk away. Like that's a lot of work to set up those kind of fires up. And, uh, you know, this is gonna get you a fire a lot quicker. But you do have to spend time once you light it, maintaining it, it's just, you know, when are you gonna spend that time basically? right at the outset or ahead of time before you actually light it. The thing I do all the time still is just add too much wood and walk away and it goes out because you know I smother it or um, I don't leave it set up well enough. I'm just not patient. I do that on a fairly regular basis. It's pretty ridiculous after all these years, but things like this, you know, where I just stuff too much wood in there and it sucks all the heat away from the, the flame. I don't think it's gonna be a problem this time, but I never do. And then I walk off and come back and I have no fire. Okay, that should do for uh, at least 45 minutes, half an hour. So generally I want these apples to hang on the tree because they're not gonna improve in storage after I pick them, but I wanna get these seeds harvested and there's a lot of them here, more than I'm gonna actually eat before they fall off. So I'm just gonna pick the ones that I hand pollinated. Like these here are Lady Williams, but all of them I wrote on them already with a Sharpie. So I know exactly what they are. And so I can just pick all the hand pollinated ones as long as I wrote on them, like I said, I'll, I'll double check. 
And these things really hang on the tree. They don't come off easy. Appaloosa, all of these apples here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, I think, all pollinated with Appaloosa, which is one of my red flushed seedlings. So this one's exciting because Appaloosa is two late apples crossed together, crossed to this late apple. So hopefully you get the idea, right? More late hanging apples and hopefully eventually with red flush because Appaloosa is a red flushed apple, very red. Uh, looks like golden russet. Yeah, that's interesting. Now here, I didn't write on these, so we got to mark that. Sometimes I can't read my own handwriting later. And other interesting news on this apple, I asked my friend Mark Albert about it, and he says he has a map uh, where one of the original trees is. It's not the original Pomo Sinel tree, but it's, uh, you know, like an early one that was grafted by somebody. What that means is I'm probably going to be able to get some clean virus-free scions because this one has virus. So I don't like to send it out because of the virus and uh, people keep asking about it. I want more people to grow it because it's an interesting apple. I definitely wouldn't call it a first-rate dessert apple, although at its best it's, it's very good. But when it's, you know, one of my very latest apples, it's hard to be too picky. And I think it has tremendous potential for breeding stock, and it, it is a really good apple. All right, what do we got here? Allen's Everlasting. And yet more Appaloosa. Well, I really went for it on the Appaloosa. And while I'm up here, let's take off these tags so I know, you know, they don't get confused with next year's pollinations if I make some, which I probably will. And I'm pretty much, I think I'm going to have some of my own seedlings that I want to use as pollen parents besides Appaloosa on these late, super late hanging apples. So you can see those red apples over there. That's Lady Williams. That's my latest. And this is probably my second latest, although Pink Parfait has been hanging better the last two years. So look at this. Look at these guys. Pest. All right, we better, I guess we better put these away. Look at that, all hand, hand pollinations. That's a lot of seeds. Hopefully someone will want to grow them out because I can't grow them all out. This one, the chickens worked on already. Tastes very sweet. Uh, there's still a lot of kind of, not a lot. I mean, it's not a tart apple, but there's plenty of like balancing, refreshing acidity to it. Lots of banana flavor this year, much more than last year. Uh, not my favorite flavor. Um, in previous years, it's maybe a little bit more like a uh, mixed tropical fruit flavor or something like that. I don't know. Uh, it's, it's quite nice though. It's a really good eating apple. Why don't we just try one of these that's not pollinated? Still very acidic, but flavorful. So a number of people have asked about how this one, I did this video about trying to remove burnout. It almost looks like this is one that I cut off that grew back. I can't tell for sure, but it kind of looks like some of the burnout grew back around the edges, even though I cut out all of the burnout growing points. You know, on this one, it looks fine, unless some burnout starts to grow on the outside. But this, I'm pretty sure, was one that I removed. This one was for sure. This one was for sure. I think this this needs its own video though. Well, that video got totally derailed for the reason that most of my videos get derailed when I start shooting them is because I just completely crashed. My energy is so highly variable. Um, it will just go from like, you know, 60 to zero, just like that. So yeah, I totally crashed out that day, was unable to do anything for the rest of the day. Uh, this happens to me all the time. A lot of days I have no energy to work with whatsoever. Other days I'll start off okay and then I crash like often um, mid to late morning, but it's just completely variable. Other days I get up and I feel terrible, I have no energy, and then suddenly I perk up and feel fine. So yeah, that's a lot of fun, as you can imagine. And it's a reason that I uh, don't get a lot of content done anymore. Also because I've, this has happened to me so many times, I just, I'm just discouraged. And so I try less often, you know, I'll just be like, yeah, what's, you know, what's the point? Or I'll get up in the morning and I'll be planning to shoot video, but I'll just try to do like one little thing before I start, whatever it is, just small things or getting ready for, for that. And then by the time I finish that, I'm just, you know, I'm toast. So I already tried to shoot a video this morning, which was just a complete disaster. But I feel like right now my energy's on the up ramp um, versus the down the down ramp which 
you know, it's kind of, it's hard to tell for sure. So we're just going to pick up um, the d day on the homestead video again. And maybe what I should do is just film little snippets, you know, through the weeks and then tag them together and call it, you know, work on the homestead or something like that instead of trying to do these kind of like, oh, this is what I'm doing today kind of things because that just, uh, it just doesn't work for me, unfortunately. And there's really nothing I can do about it. There's no reliable intervention. You know, there's no drug intervention that's reliable. Um, there's just, there's no like, oh, make sure I get rest and sleep. It just, nothing works. It's just completely unpredictable chaos. We're just going to do some work, uh, mostly in the garden, I think, today. Some planting, and of course, uh, as always, I'll be going over all kinds of talking points as we go. There's three quality apples still left on the tree. These we talked about recently was a Pomo Sinel. Uh, back there is the red uh, Lady Williams, and we're going to check out one of my seedlings that's still hanging on when we get to the other garden. One thing I try to do before the next uh, following growing season is remove all these pollination tags so I won't get confused in the, you know, next year about uh, what is and is not pollinated. So I need to remove all of these old tags. And there's some more, but I think I'll get that when I actually prune this tree, which I hopefully I will. <laughs> this is the chestnut crab branch. I don't have very many scions of this, but I, I will have some available. I'll part with as many as I can, aff you know, afford to part with. Here's the nectarine tree that I was training up this year. So what I did is it was budded um, late summer the previous year. All this, almost all of this growth was last year. But as it grew up, I would just take off any branches that I didn't want, and that encouraged the remaining branches to grow nice and uh, long. Now, this one broke. I think I was trying to bend it, or I can't remember what, but it broke. I could either graft onto this, or I may actually grow a third branch up here, because I do want this trained a little bit high, and I feel like this branch is maybe a bit low. So if I hadn't broken this one and decided to keep it and, and train the tree this low, I would have all four of my main scaffold branches uh, selected. I don't really need four. Um, three is actually fine, so I may just keep this one. Another thing I could do is since, you know, these are both pointed kind of opposite, and if I'm only going to have three, I'd kind of rather this one was pointed this way, I can use a piece of wire to twist this like that and point it that way. And then by the end of the growing season, it'll be permanently set that way. It'll never, never go back. In fact, let's do that uh, right now. All right, I've got a simple uh, bale from a, bu you know, like a plastic bucket. Who doesn't have a bunch of those? sitting around. Let's keep it simple here. So now we're just going to form a hook up here. Okay. And put that like right there. Okay. Looks good. Just need to tweak this a little bit. Points in the right direction. And maybe just a little more. Yeah. There we go. One, two, three, this way. Um, it, it could set back my fruiting, but I kind of want to equalize these three limbs a little bit. So I'm going to go down here and cut that off. And I'm going to take this one down here and cut that off. Okay, so now one, two, three scaffolds are all about the same size. I mean, these are still going to outgrow this a little bit. Not a big deal. Also, I can decide now whether I want this to be an open center tree, which means I cut this top out completely, and I just have one, two, three branches, and then the whole center of the tree is open. Or if I do a modified central leader. Uh, it's more common to do stone fruits like peaches, plums. Uh, this is a nectarine as open center. So I would just take this out, and there would never be a center to the tree. That would just be the end of it. But in this climate, I get a lot of problems with sunburn on these top branches. You can see this tree that's all broken down, sunburn on top of the branch, sunburn on the top of the branch. All of this is dead. So considering that this is such a major problem, which obviously leads to serious problems like this branch here breaking, this one, for instance, has four major scaffold branches, one there, one here, one going out there, one there, but it also has the top. So that top goes up and branches out and forms a small top that shades uh, some of this other stuff. If you don't do that, you have to be kind of careful to leave a lot of uh, branches on the top here or it can lead to uh, sunburn. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take off um, all of these buds. I'm just gonna take out 
all of these guys. And this again is the principle of reducing growing points and forcing more growth into fewer growing points. The tree doesn't have a lot of growing points. I've taken almost all the growing points off this entire main stem right here. And that means the growth is going to be forced into these three main scaffold branches that are going to be these permanent big, you know, side uh, main limbs. And then I took most of the growing points off of this as well. So the only thing that's probably going to grow here, at least mostly, is these two right here. And those are going to shoot up real fast and uh, form a top. So this is set up. That's all I need to do for the rest of the year except get some tree paint on here. And I am going to eliminate this lower branch right here. Uh, one other thing I may do is graft one of these limbs to a different variety that fruits later. It's also a white nectarine. It's also leaf curl resistant. This main variety right here that I grafted on uh, that, you know, is this whole thing here is Stribling's White Free Nectarine. And it's excellent, but it all comes, you know, in one season. And then the next one, which is just known as Boonville Hotel, uh, comes later and it's uh, curl resistant too. So uh, my friend Mark is trying to get me some scions for that because I don't have any good ones. And that's the one other thing I might do this year besides uh, painting this up to prevent sunburn, which is important, especially since, you know, this is the west side here and this is the south side here. Originally, this limb was placed low here on the southwest side on purpose uh, to shade this lower trunk. And um, this also is providing shade, but this is coming out. This is a seedling almond that I may graft, uh, you know, another peach or something onto. But this is getting dug out this year. In fact, let's dig it out now. <sighs> Okay, so this is what a two-year-old almond rootstock looks like. Uh, just an almond seed literally planted in the ground in this spot. Uh, I can graft any peach or nectarine onto that or obviously any almond too. It's a bitter almond rootstock. It uh, could be more to uh, drought tolerant than a peach or nectarine root, which is important uh, for you know, where I live and my style of orcharding. So I'll just bed this root into uh, some damp sawdust or rotten wood or even dirt or whatever until I need it. In fact, I think I'm just gonna bury it right here on the side. As long as the roots are covered with something damp, uh, you can soak them in a bucket, but they'll eventually start to rot and have problems, especially uh, something like an almond. But this should be fine because it uh, still breathes and everything. Okay, so this is my new nectarine tree. It's planted on a 10 foot wide pit that's three feet deep, back filled with dead animals, uh, old hides, cardboard, scraps of wood, all kinds of garbage and weird stuff that uh, will improve the soil and about 10% charcoal. Why not make it completely straight? So I'll take this stick and stick it in at a sharp angle so that it holds the tree, you know, bent over. Let's just adjust that a little bit and now it's closer to straight up and down and by the time it grows a little bit next year it'll be completely set that way. One other thing I'd like to do with this tree is cover that root right there. Um, I'm probably going to have to import some dirt, keep dumping dirt on top of that root and eventually build this whole thing up so that that root's covered. I would actually like it to be covered to at least right here. Uh, I don't want that exposed because it could get sunburned pretty easy. I'm gonna plant cactus all up in this dry hillside up here. The irony about cactus in this climate is that they actually need summer water because yes, they're drought tolerant, but the, the season which they do their thing is in the summer and in the regions where cactus grow, for the most part at least, there are summer rains, right? So we have this problem where when they have the resources to grow in the winter, you know, they don't grow because there's no heat and no light. It's kind of weird. You don't have to water them a lot, but you have to water them at least strategically. And you have to water them in the dry season, which is the summer. This, uh, you know, this hillside should be slightly out of the frost pocket. And aside from that tree right there, that's probably the only thing I'm going to keep in here. I'm going to take out that tree right there and just kind of spot cactus up in here. And most of it's going to be a prickly pear and a trichocereus panachoi, which is a 
San Pedro or Huachuma. It's a columnar cactus. Yeah, I'm going to collect a bunch of both of those. Most of the prickly pear that I collect will be of uh, selected fruiting varieties. So varieties that are selected for high quality fruit, uh, which is called tuna in uh, Spanish. And you can see up here, I was going to cut terraces and I had actually laid out the first terrace. I have like a level over there and everything. And then I kept looking at it and I'm like, do I want terraces there? I don't really think I do. So I'm going to actually just spot plant them and cut little spots in, probably dig a, a big hole, uh, augment the hole with uh, oyster shell, lime, lots of charcoal, and try to get it a little more alkaline because this is super acid soil and they don't like that. Imagine like columnar cactus as much as like 10 feet high and prickly pears just covering this whole uh, dry hillside. That's what that will hopefully look like in about uh, 10 years. I'm just gonna do an emergency graft here. So this is a variety I grafted onto this tree in uh, the spring. For some reason, this got broken. It was just hanging like that, but it's actually still alive. Just broke it off. It was barely attached there. And I think I had, it just got broken at some point, maybe by birds or whatever, and I had left it to uh, see if I could salvage it. This is Meyer's Royal Limber Twig. I do want to try more limber twigs, so we're going to do an emergency graft here. I honestly don't see a better spot for it right now, except for right here, and I don't even want a limb there. I actually want to just cut that off. So we're, we'll see if we can fit it here. This is not an ideal scion. This is all the more it grew because it had this, you know, whatever this problem was it had. But I'm going to go ahead and graft it down here into the previous year's wood. Uh, I don't have a grafting knife with me, so I'm just going to use this open L, which should work totally fine. If I had to do all of my grafting with this knife, there, it really wouldn't be a problem. I just prefer a grafting knife. I'm looking at the cambium layer. So the cambium layer is this, this uh, fine line here between the wood and the bark, and that's what I want to match up. So I need to go deeper. Now you see how I have so much wood here? Like the wood is this wide, and then the, this wood is this wide. Those are pretty similar. That's what I'm looking for. I'm not looking at the overall width of the whole twig or anything. So I think that will probably work tolerably well. Cut a, uh, a tongue in here. And cut a tongue in this, a little more difficult. See how I'm pulling the knife to make a slice and I'm not just pushing? It's much less clumsy, you don't have to use as much force and you have a lot more control. Yeah, chances are that'll grow. I got happen to have a little grafting tape with me because tis the season. I don't really like this grafting tape, but I use it because I have it and I want to use it up and it's handy to have a roll just stick it in your pocket. So the original tag is still on there. Uh, chances are that'll, yeah, that'll probably take. I've been preparing some garden beds here so that, you know, they're got them weeded off and mulch so that in the spring I can just pull this mulch off and they'll be pretty much ready to plant. That's a turnip, uh, still perfectly good. I might uh, pickle that pretty soon. I am uh, fairly determined to have a garden this year. I've had less and less of a garden for quite a few years now, largely for the same reasons that I don't shoot as many videos anymore, which is just getting, you know, discouraged and beat down by failure. Uh, all kinds of things. I don't really want to go into it, but not being able to actually eat the food, um, not being able to make it to the farmer's market to sell stuff when I was growing farmer's market stuff, not having the energy, you know, starting the garden and not being able to take care of it. You know, gardeners are optimistic by nature. You have to be, or, you know, we wouldn't do it. So I am trying to I'm feeling more optimistic this year for some reason. Uh, part of me is just like, yeah, you're an idiot. The same stuff's going to happen, and there's no reason it wouldn't. But I'm going to go for it anyway. I'm just going to proceed from here on out as if I'm going to have an actual garden with, you know, a lot of different stuff planted. Right now I'm planting leeks, and these are potato onion seeds that I uh, had saved. And I started growing some as, you know, experiments to grow new varieties. This one is uh, giant Bulgarian leek, potato onions. I'm just going to plant this whole flat to onions. I like to start my alliums, so all the onions and leeks and stuff like that, I like to start um, early, a month early ahead of everything else. Really January 15th, uh, January 15th to February 1st is kind of my target for starting onions. 
This onion is very interesting. It's a very rare heirloom that I'm gonna to try to grow. And if I can actually get these seeds to grow, which they probably won't because so far they've been 100% failure rate. I got two different batches. I had to import them from Europe, complete fail. But if I can get these growing, I wanna start saving seeds. And if they're good, which I have a feeling they're gonna be really good. Sell those on eBay until someone else figures out that it's a good idea. I mean, I did really good with my potato onions. It helped, you know, help me get by and help fund some of my projects until everyone else got the idea that, oh, wow, you can sell these. Uh, yeah, that was it. So I'm going to just plant really all the seed I have of this. They say never plant all your seed in uh, one batch, but I'm pretty sure these are going to be a complete failure. So I'm just going to really put tons of them in here and hope like 5% survive or something like that. Okay, let's start labeling before I forget what's what. These tags are cut from printing plates, uh, aluminum printing plates from an old school print press. If you have an old school printer that still uses these anywhere near you, get a big stack of these before they are all gone because they're quickly being replaced by digital printers. And they're super handy. They make great plant tags. You can write on with a pencil. I use them for tree tags. Um, they make good collars for fruit trees to protect them from voles and other rodents. Okay, we're going to plant more Rose de Roscoff here. Again, I don't really mind if I use up all these seeds because I just don't think they're going to grow. If they do, great. So you can cut this stuff with, uh, you know, scissors. Just got a crappy pair of scissors I keep in the garden here. The writing on them in the pencil is actually pretty permanent. You know, I have writing, pencil writing on these that are probably, gosh, 10 years old or more. And uh, you can still read. So let's do these red marble onions, which I think is supposed to be a keeper. I think it's kind of like a cipollini type, like a flat cipollini type. I don't know why you'd call it red marble if it's... Maybe it's marble, the stone, not the toy. And I think I'll do some candy onions just because they're really good. They're pretty gourmet, very large. I'm more interested in keepers, but I don't really have that much seed for keepers left. Well, that was a lot of seed. And I could plant some scallions, but I'm not gonna. What I'm gonna do instead is every time I find a onion base in the compost, I'm just gonna replant it somewhere. And then I'll have green onion tops to use as scallions. Good enough for me. It's best to just bend these a little bit like that, give them like a, a little curve that way, and they're, they're a lot stiffer and stronger that way. I will just sprinkle some soil on top here. And I don't want to disturb the seeds really, so I'm just going to put a bunch on here, and that all the seeds are at least partially covered. Just flatten this off a little bit. Just get it settled in here and get it off to a good start. These flats are made with redwood, uh, which is very rot resistant. Some of it's better than others. Um, I'm not sure about this one. I'm not even sure I made that one, but this is like real good old growth redwood and it'll last a real long time. One thing I'm gonna do different though is next time I'm gonna standardize these sizes. So I have two very specific heights and two very specific sizes this way that you know the small flats are exactly half the size of the big flats so that if I were to stack two small flats together, they would be exactly the same dimensions on the outside as one large flat. That's just so that things are standardized and then I could make different tops for them, like screens, for instance, you know, to keep out bugs and mice or plastic things to uh, keep moisture in for like a little greenhouse effect or something like that. In the meantime, though, I just have kind of random sizes of these that I've made. A lot of regions have some type of wood that doesn't rot very fast, you know, or is really rot resistant. And here it's redwood, uh, you know, back east could be black locust, cypress, cedar in the northwest. So there isn't really much that I start at this time of year. My garden calendar is very simple. It's divided into firsts and fifteenths. So every two weeks I have a target thing of, you know, maybe I'm going to plant. So that makes it easy to remember, right? Every time it's the first of the month, you can think, oh, what do I plant now? And then look at the calendar. 
So my main planting is on February 15th, and I just try to do everything within two weeks of that date. But there's just a huge amount of stuff I plant then. Then there's a whole nother batch that gets planted, you know, two to four weeks later. And I'll just look and say, okay, now uh, cucurbits, like cucumbers, squash, March 15th. Because every time you get to the, the middle of the month or the beginning of a month, you automatically think, oh, what do I plant now? And I find that works excellent. You know, you just start writing them down each year and, you know, divide the year into calendar months like that or, you know, every two weeks like that. And a lot of the year you won't be planting anything. And then just start making notes of what you plant at certain times of year and you'll just kind of move them around until you get to the the right time to plant these different things. I like to keep things simple like that. That's an elegant solution and it uh, has worked really well for me. So something else I need to do here is set traps because the mice in here will eat seeds. They'll come up to the flats and dig the seeds out. I mean, they're not gonna get these onion seeds. They won't like those. I have a real problem with other seeds, especially apple seeds. They really like to eat the little seedlings right when they come up. And so I basically have to start trapping mice, um, you know, like a week ahead of planting apple seeds or any other thing that they like to eat. You know, they'll eat like beet seeds, they'll eat uh, squash, cucumber, a lot of different things. And they know they're in the flats, they can smell them or something, and they'll dig them right up. And so they're digging in the flats and screwing them all up. These traditional Victor snap traps with the metal plates work really well. I just bought a four pack of those and with four traps set, I think it was three nights I caught 11 mice and every time one of these traps went off, it got a mouse. So they work pretty good with just a little smear of peanut butter. So I'll usually set some up here on the bench and some down below. I'll have at least one mouse by tomorrow, probably more than one. Sometimes I catch voles in here too, uh, often called meadow mice. They're chubby little rodents with fat heads and short tails. They're more of a problem out in the garden, but the mice, the regular like little wild deer mice, they're a real big problem. And here we are the next morning. Looks like this mouse probably set off both of these traps. One more mouse there. And here we go again. The next day, another mouse, a banana slug. Oops, this is a bull. See, it's got like this short tail, kind of big fat head. I'll get mice every night, probably for a while clean out as many as I can before I plant my seeds. So here's the uh, contorted San Pedro that I was propagating in another video and I sold some of these this year. In fact this one is still for sale and it's listed on my website. It's the last one and then I'm keeping a few to uh, you know propagate even more of them. So this one, that one, that one, and this one here. I'm just going to keep building up plants to propagate from so I can grow hopefully like you know maybe 20, 30, 40 plants a year. So let's take a break to taste an apple that's down here. This is grenadine crossed with an unknown apple, 11 number 3, 2011. It's the most russeted seedling apple I've grown yet. It is actually looking kind of interesting at this point. We're approaching February here. I think it's the 25th of January. This is still very, very much in good shape. I believe it was scab resistant or even scab immune, but I'm not sure I'll have to look at my notes. I don't see any scab on any of the ones that were remaining late. Obviously it hangs on the tree extremely well. It has a fairly high tannin content, uh, but that could make it a good cider apple. And I think under better growing conditions, it would be less tannic. It's not too tannic to eat though, and it has a rich flavor and a lot of sugar. Uh, so, you know, for something, a piece of fruit that you can pick off the tree, probably until at least February 1st, I'm guessing, um, it's actually pretty good. It's not particularly uh, crisp or crunchy, but it's still kind of firm. It feels very hard but it just doesn't have any kind of like a crispiness or crunchiness to it. Uh, but although it's not really, you know, mealy or anything offensive like that. Well, if a person wanted to try very late hanging cider apples, uh, it could be interesting. It also might be the, uh, something that's worth breeding with. So I'm gonna keep an eye on this one and propagate it out somewhere. Uh, just the fact that it's so late hanging and so durable looking is pretty intriguing. Here's something pretty neat. There was a little bit of excavating done in this area and this piece of limestone came out of the ground. I've never seen limestone on this property and it's obviously just this like odd concretion. See how it's kind of like rounded. It almost looks like a bag of cement that got left out. 
So I'm going to bust this up sometime and uh, burn it and make uh, lime. I wish I could find an outcropping of limestone anywhere in this area, let alone on the property. But I think this is just kind of a weird anom anomalous, you know, blob of limestone. I want to pick some olives. I used to be really interested in olives. I'm, it's not that I'm not now, I just got kind of sidetracked by apples and other stuff. And uh, I collected quite a few different varieties of olives, mostly table and dual purpose varieties, you know, stuff that's good for both uh, table olives and uh, oil. And the variety we're going to look at, I just call it um, Sakamano. It was growing on this driveway of these people named Sakamano. Let's see, is this it or is this something else? Let me, let me double check this. I might have the name wrong here. I think this one is Dolce de Morocco, or at least that's what it's labeled as. Boy, those are real ripe. Yeah, that's Dolce de Morocco, which means sweet of Morocco. Olives are like um, apples in that there's just a lot of different varieties that are good for different things. So you can't assume that just because you have some olives and they're black, you can make good black olives in salt brine or whatever. Or if they're green, that you can make good, you know, Spanish olives or dried olives or whatever. They're all good for different things. There's a tremendous amount of genetic variation going on there. This particular variety is really good for ripe brining. So in this state right here, if you pick them super careful, and these are dead ripe. Some of them are like too old and wrinkled even. But this particular variety, for whatever reason, you can pick it super ripe and brine it in salt for months and it will hold up really well. Like it won't turn into a total mush ball. And most varieties will not do that. Some of the black olives that you buy, like the California ripe olives, quote unquote, you know, ripe, were actually picked when they're green and they're turned black by exposure to iron. So they expose it to these iron salts and it turns the probably the tannins uh, with tannic acid. If you take a hide that's dyed in tannic acid and turn, put it in iron, it'll turn black because of this reaction that happens. I'm going to get two hands going here. But anyway, most olives, if you let them ripen this far and put them in salt brine, they'll just get all mushy and gross. Now the downside to this variety is that it's very bitter and it takes a lot of changes of salt brine. You have to soak it in salt brine for like a couple of weeks and then change the brine every two to four weeks for uh, many times in order to get them sweet enough. So a more ideal processing olive for this type of olive would not be as bitter. Uh, this, this is probably more like a um, an oil olive, whatever it is, but I, I really don't know what it is. It's just an olive that I found growing in front of someone's house and picked for many years. Usually the traditional time for me to pick this olive where it grows, you know, the original trees are, is around Christmas or New Year's. So we're a few weeks late, but they, they look like they're still good. They're incredibly durable. They seem tolerant to freezing. I've picked these uh, when the ground was, you know, frozen under my feet and they were still good. This is really the first significant olive harvest I've had. I'm a little late. There were actually a lot more on here. They're not the bird's favorite food, but they do eat them. They're very nutritious and I don't know if they really care if they're bitter or not. So this is kind of historic because I planted these olives, you know, maybe 12 years ago or something like that. And they're, they're finally bearing some fruit. Kind of the culmination of a, an old dream. You can get olives to bear quicker than that, although they are, they're pretty slow. But, you, you know, I mean, they take a while and these were poorly cared for, not really cared for at all. They were just established and probably never watered since they were first established. This side's got quite a few. Okay, so what I'm gonna do with these, once I have them all picked, I'm picking them very carefully. I'm not dropping them into the bowl. These are extremely prone to bruising and they don't improve when you bruise them. I will very carefully with a sharp knife cut one or two slits. I usually do two in each olive. And that's to let the brine in and out, you know, through the skin because the skin is pretty resistant to moisture passing in and out. You can do it without cutting them, but it takes much longer between, you know, salt brine changes. So if you cut them, you can change the brine a lot more often. It's tedious work, but you know, it's just like, if the olives are good and these are almost 100% good, you just pick them up, 
cut them really fast and drop them in another bowl. So it's not a lot of work. I'm probably just going to go watch the fights and uh, sit around and cut these. And I'll put the uh, proportions on the screen right now, but I start with a weaker brine, and then in two weeks I change that to a stronger brine. And then every two to four weeks, whenever I remember, sometimes longer, I put on the second stronger brine. You know, I put on another batch of that. Now, you do need enough salt to preserve them, or you can get botulism growing in your olives. There was a big olive botulism scandal where people got poisoned by canned olives. And I think that's an event in history that changed, you know, food laws because this was a long time ago. And even when I was a kid, there was still this idea that olives could poison you because of that thing that happened in like, I think it was the turn of the century, maybe even the late 1800s. But now that thing has been lived down and people are often not careful enough with olives. So if you make a weak brine that's not very salty and you try to store that, whether inside or outside your fridge for too long, you can end up with botulism growing in your olives. And I don't think this is like, you know, being too paranoid. Learn the rules. It's basically 10% salt or higher, or the pH has to be a certain level. And I think it's about four, I think it's 4.5. Um, now, the further you stray from those parameters, and it doesn't have to be both of those things, it, it can be one or the other. But the further you stray from those parameters, I think the more likely, you know, you can get botulism growing in there. Really, botulism is the name of the condition that we get, I think, but it's just this certain bacteria that grows in the absence of oxygen, and it produces just this really, really bad toxin that can uh, easily kill you. And I think that's a lot of the, uh, you know, history of like severe deadly food poisoning is basically you know, botulism from this organism growing in these certain conditions. And in some of those cases, you know, it was probably like it usually was okay, right? But not always. Another thing that people used to do is open canned goods, put them in a pot and boil them hard because that actually destroys this toxin apparently is what, I, what I've read. You know, you basically, they would recook the food, but Botulism is the reason that low acid foods like say canned green beans, canned meat, things like this which are low acid have to be canned in a pressure cooker because a pressure cooker gets hotter. It's also very heat tolerant so you need a higher temperature and you can't reach those temperatures without a uh, pressure cooker. So yeah people used to can meat without pressure canners but they often did this thing I think where they cooked the food after they opened the can to destroy the toxin. One reason I haven't planted more olives here is we have something called the olive fruit fly. It's very bad. I mean, when I first started processing olives and getting interested in olives like 20, 25 years ago or something like that, probably, probably longer, I was just so into them because here's this plant that's super drought tolerant. It's easy to propagate. It's easy to grow. We had virtually no significant pests on olives at all. Nothing bothered them. And then, boom, one day it's like, oh, the olive fly is in California. And now I'll go to pick trees like down right in town here. It'll be like almost 100% infected, you know, infested with these flies. And they're, they're like a grub that burrows around on the olive, totally ruins it for anything really, like even oil, except for industrial oil, so. Since I'm isolated up here in the mountains, you'd think, well, maybe, uh, you know, they wouldn't make it up here. It'd be a long time till they make it up here. But unfortunately, my neighbors planted an olive orchard. So there's like a two acre olive orchard within almost a stone's throw down here. So eventually the, the fly will probably find their place. And then it's all over, you know. So the brining process I'm going to do here, the salt brining, you can do anything from like red to black, um, even like greenish olives, as long as they're basically, you know, partially ripe. With these, I'm always picking them when they're either black or red or somewhere in between. So I'll do like two different batches, but you can also just mix them together. And I don't have that many, so I might just mix them together too. Let's, uh, let's go pick the Dolce de Morocco. Uh, you would think that this olive would be not very bitter, 
Let's actually taste it and compare it to the Sakamano, which I know is especially bitter. Okay, it's definitely not unbitter. It is quite bitter. Um, let's try the Sakamano to compare. Uh, possibly that's more bitter. I can't really tell though. Let's pick these little guys and try to salt brine them. Chances are they're just going to turn to mush, but who knows? Who knows? Maybe this is some famous Moroccan black table olive that's very durable and delicious and amazing. And maybe it will leach out quickly. Maybe it's mislabeled because, um, I mean, it's really common for fruit cheese in general to be mislabeled, misidentified, etc. But I would say olives are much higher incidence. I've had several that I bought that turned out to be things completely different. And at least two of those were from like the main olive nursery in California, or originally the most diverse and original one, which is uh, the Santa Cruz Mountains Olive Nursery. I think it's called something like that. It's pretty disappointing to grow something for, you know, eight years before it fruits, and then you're like, oh, that's not what I bought. And one of those is my Pichelin olive, which is, I was like super excited about. I, I really like Pichelin olives. And so I was all excited about that. You know, eight years later, the thing fruits, and I'm like, hey, that's not a Pichelin. There's a few different ways you can process olives. The most common ones are fermented green. You know, that's how the Spanish style olives that are stuffed with pimentos are made. I'm a big fan of those. And uh, I make them with various different kinds of olives. The most common ones that are done that way are Manzanillo, uh, Queen is done that way. Like that green olive flavor that you associate with green olives. It's like a strange, pungent, really unique taste that nothing else tastes like. That's not really the taste of the olive, that's the taste of the ferment. Like, they don't taste like that when they're green at all. It, it requires that they're fermented. You know, you have to ferment green olives to get that taste. So another way to cure olives is the way I'm gonna do it, where you just soak them in salt brine and keep changing the brine. Those do ferment a little bit. You can also ferment them partially and then leach them with salt brine. There's like a lot of different things you can do along those lines. The olives known as California ripe olives are picked when they are in the green milk stage. So the olives are green or they start to actually turn kind of yellow, like a straw color. And they're picked at that stage. They are put into lye and uh, lye isn't this terrible, scary thing. It's just sodium hydroxide. It's, uh, it's not really like toxic. It's just, you know, it's, it's a caustic poison in quantity. You know, it's just a matter of like how much you're consuming. Really strong, it's very, very caustic and it kind of like eats its way through the skin. It doesn't eat the skin away, but it makes the skin porous and it leaches out the bitterness. And this happens really, really fast. So it's a way that you can get the bitterness out of the olives quick. So they are leached um, almost all the way to the pit with this lye and that gets the bitterness out, like almost all the bitterness. And then the lye is rinsed out and they're turned black by exposure to air and iron. And then they're put into a light brine that's really, you know, just enough salt to taste good, basically. This is one of the places that people run into trouble with olives is that they, they make olives like that with the lye. They leach most of the lye out, but they don't really get all of it out, which leaves the olives in kind of an alkaline condition. I mean, not only are they not acid, they're not even neutral. And that favors the growth of bacteria if it's, if it's too, um, if the pH is too high. And then they put it in a weak brine that's just basically made to taste good. And these conditions can allow um, the organism that creates botulism to grow in there. And they'll just leave them in the refrigerator for, you know, six months or a year or whatever and keep eating them. And that's not safe to do. So you either need acid or extremely high salt. What I do with these is once they're done, they're in this really strong salt brine, right? Extremely salty, about 10%. And I'll just store them in that, you know, in a cool place. And then when I wanna use them, I'll take out say like a pint or a quart jar of them and I soak them in water overnight. And that just gets rid of enough of the salt that they're not so salty. Then I add vinegar, any kind of herbs or anything I wanna add. Um, some olive oil, some water, like certain proportions of all that stuff and some herbs. And after another day or two of sitting 
those are ready to eat. So then I have like, say, a pint or a quart of those. When I'm almost out, I just take out some more of the salty olives, put them on water and do it all over again. Now you could heat can them, uh, but every time I've tried to heat can an olive, it's terrible. So I'm not really interested in that. I know they do it commercially, like with the California quote unquote ripe olives that I just described, which I like by the way. I mean, maybe it's just cause I grew up here eating them all the time on like, you know, in enchiladas and on Thanksgiving, like when you're a little kid, you take the olives and stick them on your fingers and eat them like thimbles. Anyway, I'm not so much of a snob that I don't like those. I think they're actually really good. If you make them yourself and you don't heat can them, they're like candy. They're actually really, really good. And only a, a freaking uptight olive snob would think they're not amazing. They're very good. They're just not some kind of fermented, herby, old world thing. Freaking olive snobbery, which I am against, if you didn't notice. I'm getting kind of wet here. So if you plant olives in California, don't just go to the store and buy whatever they have. It's going to usually be oil olives. It makes no sense to plant one or two olive trees in your yard if they're oil olives because you're never going to have enough to make any significant quantity of oil and they won't necessarily be any good for making table olives. It's kind of like planting just cider apples. Like what if you went to the store, a nursery, and you wanted to buy an apple tree and they didn't tell you anything about the varieties and they just have these varieties and you plant one and it turns out that they're all cider varieties that are bitter. Um, you know, they just, <laughs> they're just not made for eating. Well, that's basically what's going on right now with the olive uh, thing in California is you go to the nursery and at least half the trees are just these oil varieties that make no sense for a homeowner to plant unless you're gonna plant like a whole bunch of them, which almost nobody does. Okay, let's go take a quick look at my basket willow. I just wanna see how it's doing. All right, this is my basket willow patch. It's a little coyote brush seedling. I don't want that growing here. You can see there's some more there. I should dig and pull up all of those. I do not want those here. Several varieties of basket willow here. This one, believe it or not, is called green dicks. And there's a bunch of different dick varieties uh, from England. And I don't know what that means. All I know is that this is the variety I like the best because it's small. Uh, the shoots are, are smaller than a lot of varieties. And I find that this size is more useful for me for the kind of baskets I wanna make. So right here, you can see from over there, these get quite a bit taller. I'm not sure what variety this is. It might be Polish purple, or it might be some uh, red willow of some kind. This is Italian yellow or Italian golden. Not a fan. I just can't get this thing to grow very good shoots. They tend to be branchy and not very, you know, well tapered. I'm gonna take those out. Tried to grow these well. I've harvested it at another place where there's like a whole pond and there's a ton of these that I've gone and cut them back before. Um, and even, you know, they just never grow well. So yeah, I mean, they're really pretty. The color's nice, but they just don't perform. I had another one here. I think it was black mall, like 100% of those died. So I'm replacing, trying to replace those right there. Uh, but these two varieties are, are real good. In this situation, it's not like really excellent willow country right here. Like this ditch stays damp in the summer, but it's not like growing them in the Northwest or England or something. So even the large varieties like this one here grow pretty uh, small in this area. So I like both of these varieties quite a bit. Hopefully I'll be harvesting these within the next uh, two or three weeks. I may have some cuttings for sale, so watch out for that along with the, the scions uh, because these are incredibly easy to grow. If you have a damp spot, you just stick a, a stick in the ground. It's that simple. I gotta go because it's getting really wet out here. I had bears tear this fence down, get in here this year totally broke all these trees up. That used to be a really nice tree right there and they broke every single branch on it. All this right here is from wild pigs uh, digging around. I almost never see them here. They'll just show up one night and leave a bunch of damage and they're gone. There's another olive tree that hasn't started fruiting. Oh, actually, there are a few fruits there. 
Dang, those look small. I bet that's I bet that's a mislabeled one too. I don't know what that's supposed to be. All right, over and out.